you bought but didn't quite finish the brief history of time, you may be glad to hear that Professor Stephen Hawking's about to publish what he says is a rather simpler sequel, The Universe in a Nutshell. How easy can you get? Anyway, in his latest book, Professor Hawking's laying out his concept of theoretical physics, describing the principles that he believes control the universe. Now Stephen Hawking doesn't often give interviews as most of you will know. He has motor neuron disease. It makes speaking very difficult for him. He communicates through a computer voice simulator. But Sarah Montague went to visit him in Cambridge to talk to him, to try to unravel and indeed to understand some of his latest ideas. Characters in science fiction like Doctor Who are always traveling through other dimensions. But it now seems that other dimensions may be science fact rather than science fiction. We now have reason to believe that space-time may have more than the three dimensions of space and one dimension of time that we experience. If there are more dimensions, why can't we move in them as we can in the three spatial dimensions that we know exist and the fourth dimension of time? Why don't we see these extra dimensions? Why can't we move in more directions than forwards or backwards? sideways and up or down the answer may be that we live in a brain world your brain is spelled b r a n e it means a membrane or surface in a larger space brains are the brain child of my colleague paul townsend at cambridge the idea is that matter and light would be confined to the brain thus we could not travel through or even see the extra dimensions. However, we would feel them because gravity would spread through the extra dimensions from shadow brains that we cannot see. There could be shadow galaxies, shadow stars, and even shadow people who might wonder about the gravity they feel from matter on our brain. To us, such shadow objects would appear to be dark matter, matter that can't be seen but whose gravity can be felt. Can you give us an idea of how this brain world would work? The formation of a brain world would be like the appearance of bubbles of steam in boiling water. Fluctuations in the vacuum would cause brain worlds to appear from nothing as bubbles. The brain would form the surface of the bubble, and the interior would be the higher dimensional space. Very small bubbles would tend to collapse again to nothing, but a bubble that grew by quantum fluctuations beyond a certain critical size would be likely to keep on growing. People, such as us, living on the brain, the surface of the bubble, would think the universe was expanding. It would be like painting galaxies on the surface of a balloon and blowing it up. The galaxies would move apart, but no galaxy would be picked out as the center of expansion. Let's hope there's no one with a cosmic pin to deflate the bubble. Is there any way to prove this theory is right? It might be possible in the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, that is being built in Geneva. A tiny black hole wouldn't gobble up the Earth, as some scare stories would have one believe. Instead, the black hole would disappear in a puff of Hawking radiation, and I would get a Nobel Prize. So onward the LHC. If we do, will that be the theory of everything? Because this is something you promised 20 years ago in your last book. And now we have your new book and one wonders, will we ever know the theory of everything? I think there is a good chance we will find a theory of everything. I had hoped it would be by the end of last century, but my guess now is the end of this century. Do you think that will lead science to being able to prove or disprove the existence of God? It depends what you mean by God. If God is the embodiment of the laws that govern the universe, then we would have discovered God. But it wouldn't be a personal God. You've always made it clear you are an atheist, despite the fact that God appears an awful lot in your books. And yet, back in 1962, you were given three years to live. Here you are, nearly 40 years later, defying the laws of nature. You must have wondered, even on occasion, whether God had a hand in that. Motor neuron disease is a difficult condition to predict. 
I must be one of the few that live longer. Let me ask you a very big, broad question now. We're in a situation where we are now supposedly at war, at war with terrorism. And uh, whether it's anthrax attacks or precision bombing, yet again we're seeing scientific developments in warfare being used in warfare. What are your thoughts about this war? I would describe it as fairly low tech. Anthrax was considered as a weapon in the Second World War, and crashing planes into buildings has been possible for a long time. On the other side, the US bombing is pretty much World War II. What do you think is the greatest threat to the survival of mankind? Probably a genetically engineered virus, either by accident or design, or global warming becoming unstable and running away. We might end up like Venus, boiling hot and raining sulfuric acid. You paint a very gloomy picture. Is it something that we can do something about? Something that perhaps we underestimate the scale of? I am very worried about global warming. That was why I supported Gore against Bush in the US election. It is disturbing to think the fate of the world may have been decided by a few punched holes in Florida. In your book, you come up with a way that perhaps human beings can become more intelligent. Do you really think that's possible? I don't think we ourselves can become more intelligent. But once we identify the genes that govern mental development, we can design future generations that are more intelligent. Some would say we shouldn't do that, but someone somewhere is bound to try.